Welcome back to the Dig in the Greats podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Shaw. You know, for the first few episodes, I was recording separate video and audio intros. Like, I got this mic right here, right? But I'm gonna keep it simple, same for both. So if you're watching this on video, this is probably your first time hearing the theme music. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast, I'm happy to have you here. My guest today is House Shoes, a legendary DJ and producer. I recently posted a video on the main channel all about De La Soul's Stakes is High, which was produced by Jay Diller. A short clip from this conversation is in that video because House Shoes put out the JD unreleased EP, which features a remix of Stakes is High. Well, today I'm bringing you the full conversation. We talk about his beginnings in music, the scene at St. Andrew's Hall, some Dilla, his record label Street Corner Music, fatherhood, a crazy story about the Secret Service, and just generally nerd out about music. You'll want to follow House Shoes online, check out Street Corner Music, and check out his Twitch DJ stream every Monday and Wednesday. I got links for all that in the description. For now, let's dive in. Here's my conversation with House Shoes. Shoes, thank you so much for for sitting down and chatting. I appreciate this so much. Hey, man, thanks for having me, bro. I, so I guess to start, like, take me back to your very beginnings with music. Like, how did you get into music? Um, what was your, like, did you play an instrument? How did you get into DJing? Like, break, <laughs> break that down for me. Got you. All right, well, music. Music started, uh, I mean, music was played in the house. You know what I mean? Um, both of my parents had record collections. Uh, my parents divorced when I was at an early age. One of the routines when I went to see my dad on the weekend was going to the record store. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'd come home from school and my mom would be cleaning the house and there'd always be a record playing. Yeah. or a tape, or a CD, or the radio, you know what I mean? Um, as far as if I was ever, like, actually instrumentally, like, musically inclined, uh, I think it might have been fourth grade, maybe fifth grade, hmm. band class <clears throat> starts, and I was, like, for some reason at the last of the list, I feel. Uh, yeah. And there was only, like, a few instruments left. And I picked the coronet. All right. Uh, and I couldn't buzz my lips. Yeah. <laughs> and the teacher, it, one of the first times that I really like stood up and walked out or just like I was fed up with somebody. I remember the teacher like yelling at me, like buzz your lips. And I just stood up and walked out of the class. <laughs> <laughs> but I always loved music. I mean, I, I didn't get into hip hop until like, late fourth, fifth, maybe early fifth grade. Yeah. But even before that, it was tapes or an album or, you know, I mean, my first record was probably Walt Disney, The Three Little Pigs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a Steve Martin record when I was like five years old. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, Pac-Man Fever. <laughs> you know, just really kind of pedestrian shit. Yeah. Um, DJing was a gradual progression. Uh, I got into hip hop in the fifth, maybe the fifth grade, early fifth grade. Uh, it was this cat, Ron Garrison, Roderick, actually Roderick Garrison moved in and it was kind of Lily white. Uh, we were right outside the city a few miles, but the flight hadn't take place to that extent. Yeah. In the area that designated the population of my elementary school, middle school was much more of a mixture. High school was a fucking melting pot. Yeah, um, yeah. But met Ron Garrison. His uncle was Father MC, <laughs> mm. which was super crazy. And he had all the tapes. He had Houdini. He had the Fat Boys. He had, uh, you know, Run DMC, of course. He had, like, the comps. I can't remember the name of them, but it was, like, Break In. Or, you know yeah. what I mean? It would have, like, UTFO and uh, Word of Mouth, King Cut, all those joints. And those weekend trips to the record store got much more pointed. Yeah. And definitely. I started, you know, saving my allowance. My, my mother and my stepfather would go out to eat or they would have like a date night every Thursday night. And they would leave me money to order some food. And sometimes I would go to the record store or I would save that money for next Tuesday. Cause I knew something was going to be coming out. Yeah. Um, throughout high school, 
middle school, high school, you know, trading tapes, dubbing tapes for the homies. Uh, I went to Eastern Michigan University after high school. And uh, it didn't last long. And when I got kicked out, I got kicked out of school for arson, actually, which is a, a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hell of a thing to get kicked out for. Yeah, it wasn't me, though. They scapegoated no. me because uh, <laughs> oh, one gosh. night, one night, me and all the homies were going to the eateries. We were all stoned out of our mind. Towel under the door. Paper towel. Fucking fabric softener <laughs> sheets. You know what I mean? <laughs> Blowing out the window, and all our eyes are closed. We're walking down the hallway to get to the elevator, going under the eateries, which is the cafeteria. And you know, you have the cork boards that have all the messages yeah. from students and RAs and all that. And we're walking by the cork board, and I take my lighter and I light a piece of paper on the board, and I just put it catches on fire, and I'm like, "Oh shit!" And I put it out real quick. I literally burnt like the corner off of a post-it note. <laughs> <laughs> and unbeknownst to me, there was some fucking maniac going through the freshman dorms, just lighting them on fire and walking away. Oh. So they stuck that on me, and it was the greatest singular event in my life <laughs> because I went home and I spent all the money that was left on the records mm. and started going down to St. Andrews every Friday bring yeah. a little stack of records and trying to get the end of the night. You know what I mean? So it yeah. all, it all came from that. Yeah. Well, I've heard the story, uh, about how you came to be the DJ at St. Andrews. Right. Um, uh, there was a, a fight between, uh, th remind me three floors There's yep. a fight between two of them. Yep. Uh, and then you have been trying to get in the door and then, and then that was your moment. Yeah. April of 94, 29 years ago. Oh, wow. Crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tell me about St. Andrews. Cause I mean, that, that three floor thing is very fascinating. It's like hip hop, uh, alt rock and, uh, the dance, like electronic stuff, right? Yeah. House techno. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I've heard lots of stuff about kind of the importance of that, uh, scene, but, um, it's, it, tell me about what that, that was like back in the day. Oh, uh, man. I mean, oddly enough, at the age I'm at now, one thing I've come to realize is kind of what a singular uh, that event was. Hmm. And it's strange that other spaces like that didn't exist. I mean, of course they exist in other places, but you yeah. just never hear about them. St. Andrew's Hall was <clears throat> uh, probably from like the, the 50s. And eventually it became an event space. And on Friday nights, they had three floors of fun. And the top floor was the best house and techno records played by the best house techno DJs. The main floor, the ballroom, big ballroom holds maybe 700 people. Uh, all, same, but with hip hop. And the basement yeah. was the same, but with alternative. And it was all ahead of the moment a little bit you know what i mean yeah. um you had these crowds that were in tune with what they liked and trying to stay on the cusp of it so you would always hear at the least the newest shit and yeah. the best shit you know what i mean um so you would get a migration between floors and so many people were exposed to those other styles of music because of those components. You know, it wasn't yeah. just a hip hop party. It wasn't yeah. just a house party. It wasn't just a fucking rock party. It was all of those things. You go so in you between got a real them, interesting like the... mix. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, and then at that time too, like during the day, you worked at uh, a couple record stores. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I worked in a lot of record stores in Detroit, but the I, I actually got uh, I got hired at Street Corner Music. That's a crazy story. It's honestly one of my favorite stories. Uh, so, like a few years ago, I went to this photo exhibit, and uh, it was B plus, uh, Danny Hastings. And I feel like a shitty person because it was a female photographer that I can't remember the name of. Hmm. 
and it was a Q&A, and they just had prints on the wall. It was a fundraiser for this, this kid's school. And when I walked in the door, it was a print of 36 Chambers cover photo, uh, Cuban links, and hard to earn, right? Danny Hastings. All printed from original negatives and all that shit. Huh. They were like between four and five, three hundred and fifty and like five hundred dollars each. Hmm. I've never spent money on art like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when I walked in, it was just kind of casual. Like I stopped for a minute. And I was like, "Damn, that's crazy." <laughs> it was yeah. the three of my favorite <laughs> albums ever. Yeah. Same photographer and just seeing those images by themselves without, you know, the text and the brand and branding and all that was it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Went and sat in on the discussion, um, hung out for a little while. And then when I was leaving, I walked by it again and I was like, ah, I'm buying this fucking hard to earn print. Yeah. And the show had like two more weeks to run with all the prints. I went down there and picked the print up after the show was done. And I came home and I opened it up. And I had an epiphany that the first time that I ever went to Street Corner Music was to buy Hard to Earn. Oh, wow. It gets deeper. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I get silly. You know, I get silly in record stores. And <laughs> I knew the record was coming out that Tuesday. I went up there. I knew they would probably be sold out of the CDs. So I asked, no, I knew they would probably be sold out of the records. So I asked for the CD. And they were like, we're hmm. sold out of the CDs. But we have one uh, import double vinyl press left. And I took it from him when I was doing like snow angels on the floor and shit. Yeah. <laughs> hooting and hollering. <laughs> I had heard about this record store from some of the homies. They said it was a dope spot. And I kind of glanced around and I was like, do you guys need, need any help? Are you hiring? Yeah. And they were like, well, we don't have cash budget, but we could pay you in credit. And I was like, I think I might have started like the next fucking day. Yeah, that's like dream scenario. So my record label is named after the record store from from this. Yeah, that's that's I love that that connection. <laughs> Synergy, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, well, let, let's talk and about then, that. And then I got hired. I got hired fucking two weeks later at St. Andrews Hall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So you're, that's the perfect, you're right smack in the middle of, I mean, All literally, physically between the floors yeah. uh, and then new music scene. And then also as new records are coming in, that's like a ideal position, especially, I mean, considering what you said about the arson thing. And then that, that being like, all right, let's buy some records. That's like yeah. the perfect setup. That's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, it was crazy. And then, you know, uh, the reason I named my record label Street Corner Music, I could not think of a brand title. Yeah. But Street Corner Music was the first store that trusted me with their money. Yeah. Uh, they made me a buyer eventually, maybe like six, seven months in. Hmm. They started giving me a budget every week, and I would order from Fat Beats and TRC and Buds. Uh so not only could you come hear me play all the brand new shit on a Friday night, you could come and buy it the next day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. could have, like had an effect on the commerce too. It wasn't just yeah. party. So you're like a, uh, a tastemaker, not only for what people are hearing, but then literally what they're buying. Yeah. Cause That's... you had to own it to hear it back in the day in, right, in exactly. some form, whether it was a mixtape yeah. or the records. I mean, we had the mixtapes in the shop too. You know what I mean? Yeah. All that. Um, well, let me ask you, because like, uh, not only like St. Andrews, but then like, obviously Dilla. And then I know, uh, I think I saw an interview, you said you did the Slim Shady EP release, like you DJ that. Yeah. So in many respects, you're like in the center of Detroit hip hop. Uh, yeah, so well, what I is mean, it? I was DJing the majority of the MC battles, you know, yeah. proof would put me on the battles because I, the beats were always the most important thing. Yeah. Like if there was some good raps on that beat on the 12 inch, that's a bonus, but I'm looking for the beats, you know, yeah. I've been doing this shit for 30 years now. Like, yeah. Where are the raps? There's no raps. It's instrumental. 
like figure it out. You hear that beat? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm just grateful for all of it, man. Yeah. Um, what do you think it is uh, about Detroit hip hop? Because hearing you talk about it, like you, you have a love for Detroit specifically, and I know you're, you're in LA now, but what do you think it is about Detroit hip hop specifically that is unique or, or special and the thing that you want to like carry on to, to other people? I mean, it was just, it, I mean, it was my youth. It was the best times of my life. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to put into words, you know, like I felt so good just being in the fucking gutter during all that shit, you know, right there, front line, you know, soldier. It mattered. Yeah. I cared. I had a responsibility. Like it was my yeah. number one fucking responsibility, man. All right, it's Saturday morning. All right, I got six days to find a bunch of heat for next Friday. Or it's yeah. an MC battle next week. I got to find some new beats that ain't nobody ever. I'm trying to make the MC not be able to rap for a minute because the beat's so good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, it's like when I hear a beat from somebody and I want to make a record with them. You know, like, I want people to feel what I felt. Yeah. But I heard that beat the first time. But, I mean, Detroit, it was it was innocence. Uh, the older I get, I feel like one of the most important things in life is innocence. And mm -hmm. it's it turns up turns out to be like the, the older you get, it dwindles. Yeah. And to some people, it becomes non-existent. You know what I mean? Yeah. But just being able to, you know, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. We weren't right. like nobody in 1995 in Detroit was like, we're changing history. <laughs> we were fucking right. faded. Bro. We were getting faded, making beats. And playing yeah. records and yeah. smoking blunts, smoking Philly blunts. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. And we yeah. really didn't give a fuck. We sat right in the middle of everything. We, we had our chance to absorb, you know, the East and the West and down South yeah. and, and spit out what we spat out. And we weren't spitting it out for you to say you liked it or it was okay. Like, we were just doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, because because that's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. And cats would just they stuck to the script. It was it was funny because it all happened kind of in that moment where there already was a shift going on between art and commerce. Yeah. But a lot of cats when they got on that machine, it was just a release, and it was just pure and completely untapped and unrefined. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think there's something to that with before the thing gets like commodified or someone gets in there and goes, Oh, we can make this a really big thing there. Like you're saying the innocence of it, there's the, the purity of it where you're just doing it because you love doing it. Yeah. I mean, we were like rebels, you know what I mean? Yeah. We were not popular in the population in that city. We were misfits. We were weirdos. The fuck yeah. is that shit y'all listening to? You know what I mean? Detroit's a regular <laughs> ass city. Detroit is your most pedestrian artist, like musically in that era. Like on Friday nights, you had legends on the corner of Congress. And then to the right of that, you had St. Andrews Hall. And legends was like 98 WJLB, radio shit, booty shaking, ghetto tech. Your typical yeah. Detroit shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's, that's that was a crazy dynamic too, because every Friday night, it'd just be all the regular shit, and some of that shit was cool, but like people didn't know that this is fucking Pandora's box right next door. Yeah, yeah, multi genre, you know what yeah. I mean? Crazy. Yeah. That's that's amazing. I love that. Um, well, yeah. Uh, tell me about because I'm doing a uh, working on a video on stakes is high, um, and that ties in with i mean i know the story of like Dela getting that beat um like it was on a beat tape that q-tip gave them uh they initially i actually uh pause just released like or at the beginning of this month um an original demo that's a completely it's them yeah the over a completely shit. Different that beat. Me up. i never knew that it was just yeah like, it was kind of like a longer one love loop yeah, exactly. Or I feel As, maybe was it a three? Was it a fucking three bar? 
That's crazy. Yeah, he, it's a it's a very brief clip. He's playing off yeah. the computer. But yeah. Um, well, the funny thing then, is, you know, you were talking about Dayla yeah. getting the beat tape, but actually, what it was is Tip was playing them a JD beat tape. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, and that beat came on, and there's the story that you know they played it off like it was right, rap. like right, exactly. You know what I mean? so, <laughs> so Tip wouldn't take it. <laughs> yeah, and then they and then they went behind his back straight to Dilla and got and got it from him. Mm -hmm. um, so then, I mean, that ties in with uh, there's the JD unreleased and the and track one is the remix of Stakes Is High. Um, so can you tell me about because that is if I understand is correct that's your first time releasing a record is that correct? Yes. yes. So I mean that panning to like where you are now and what you're doing with the street corner music label. Right. Um, I mean, you're, you've done tons of those since. So, uh, how did, can you tell me about how that came about with the remix? Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, JD unreleased stuff. Absolutely. So, uh, 1997, uh, at this point I had a portable dat player at the club on Fridays for the secrets. <laughs> we had the tape deck in the club for probably two years now. Mm. I would bring a dual dual cassette deck. Um, I would bring my tape deck to the club every Friday. For you know, ninety percent of the shit was JD shit, and it might be something else that somebody had that I would play sometimes. But it was mostly JD shit. Um, I was cramming that shit down motherfuckers' throats. Yeah. And then he died, and everybody said, "Oh man." I love, yeah, you was mad that I wasn't playing your shit. <laughs> <laughs> History cannot be rewritten. It's hilarious. Everybody has their own story, but uh, a lot of people were mad that I played so much JD shit at the club mm. to the point where, I mean, I would even tell motherfuckers, and it's a real dickhead thing to say, but I'd be like, hey, man, get a beat from Jay. I bet you I'll at least play the instrumental. <laughs> <laughs> So he would give me tapes and, you know, dat tapes. And he would play me these remixes that are supposed to be coming out. And just like one by one, the official 12 inches would come out and his remix wouldn't be on there. Hmm. And I would be the one to call him, like from the record store, time after time. Like, bro, we just got the 12 inches. Your shit ain't on here. Yeah. Like, I just got this Artifacts 12 inch and it's a showbiz remix. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um and he had given me a dat tape with a bunch of remixes on it <clears throat> to play at the club. And I was like, bro, like, let's just fucking boot like this shit. Like, everyone's acting like they're fucking with your shit. And then they're, they're giving the remixes to somebody else. And nine times out of ten, the remixes are super mid. Like, you know. Yeah. The fucking D'Angelo remix. Like, how yeah. do you turn down that Dreaming Eyes of Mine remix? Yeah. And the one that, I mean, in that era, understand that record labels have always been idiots for the most part, major record labels. And yeah. the whole hip hop R&B thing in the mid nineties was take a popular uh, East Coast style hip hop record and just put some chords over it. You know what I mean? A little extra yeah. instrumentation, maybe some additional drum programming. And get a hot R&B chick to sing on it, and that would be, you know. The D'Angelo shit, the remix was like, uh, it was I Used to Love Her. It was an Eric Sermon remix, and he took, like, I Used to Love Her and would, like, played some extra shit over it. It was cool, but come on, bro. Like, do you hear this shit? And that shit just kept happening. It kept yeah. happening over and over again. <clears throat> I was working at Street Corner. I had distribution hookups. Uh, I had Amir and Fat Beats. Amir from Kind of the Mirror was my... Uh, my sales rep at Fat Beats, uh, Peanut Butter Wolf was my sales rep at TRC, and Wolf had the Distro Connect, so we fucking pressed it up when we did it. You know what I mean? I remember driving my fucking Escort station wagon to the to the shipping spot, and it was scraping all the way back to the crib because I had like <laughs> you know thousands of fucking records in there. And calling Jay, and Jay came over the crib, and my mom popped a bottle of champagne, hmm. and I had the MPC three thousand on, and she got like champagne in the three thousand. It was crazy. Yeah, 
<laughs> my, my, my mom popped a bottle with Jay. That's a, that's a crazy story too. That's that's amazing. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, because I feel like that somebody really fucked me up a few years ago about that because you know we're not going to really go into depth and in all the rah rah shit because we're here on some positivity shit. But <clears throat> there's been drama. Uh, Dylan related drama in my life since he passed. And one day somebody was like, Man, shoes, fuck all of them. You put out JD's first record. Yeah. And I'm like, Bro, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, no, I didn't. Like, what are you talking about? And then he's like, Bro, the JD Unreleased record is the first record where JD was an artist. Yeah. And I had to sit, I fucking, uh, I had to sit down off of that because that's not what the yeah. fuck I did it for. This right, shit was right, fire. Right. It's got to be on a record. This shit needs to be played. You know what I mean? Yeah. I went on the fucking Jenny Jones show, bro. <clears throat> In December, after that record came out, I get a call from the Jenny Jones show. And they're like, someone's got a crush on you. And this is right <laughs> after, like, there was a murder that happened. In Michigan, because a dude took another dude on the Jenny Jones show with a secret crush, and he like walked next door and blew him away with a shotgun. Wow! And I was like, I don't know, man. We just had that crazy drama in the suburbs of Detroit. I don't know if I want. They're like, we're not doing that anymore. And the thing that made me say yes is I can go to Chicago, and I can work these fucking records. Hmm. And I hit yeah. my homie Lamont, Big Willie, up, and he linked me with uh, Mary Datcher, who was like the head of all the street team shit in Chicago. And the night before I went on Jenny Jones, that shit got played in like five clubs in Chicago. Mm, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then I got yeah. a hot little, hot little chick out of the deal that I kept for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I feel like the, um, the <laughs> JD unreleased, like you said, I mean, cause like this, this video I'm working on, it's basically like, uh, you know, this is later in uh, De La's career. And so they're trying to figure out where they need to go. And so uh, kind of the story behind that is they're like, you know, this is it. This is our, our last chance. Like we gotta, we gotta do this. this the stakes is high. Uh, and then, you know, they're a little later in their career. And then some of the samples too. digging through that. It's like also a little later uh, in, uh, Ahmed Jamal and James Brown's careers. Uh, but then that's near the beginning of JD stuff. Um, and he had done certainly, I mean, other stuff far side, uh, and, and then this as well, but hearing the remix, that sounds more like what people associate with Dilla than right. the, than the original one. So oh, absolutely. Yeah, so the significance of that, or where it, where he was about to go. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like yeah. his like his full form. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um. So the significance of that album for, for him, that's like it is like his first album as that sound and where he's going, and then significance for you. I mean, let's talk about street corner music, um, because I mean you've done. Hang on. Let me look at my notes here. Uh, I mean, flip sessions. I, I love like flip session stuff. They're very collaborative, yeah. um, like remix competition kind of things. Um, but then at the same time, you're also like shining a light on a lot of artists. Uh, one of my favorites on Street Corner is Soundtrack. Right. Um, that's just like. Uh, unbelievable stuff. The last, um, the last live stream I did, uh, on YouTube, I played his, um, uh, give it to me, baby. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, Rick James yeah. flip, or I'm sorry. Super freak is the one. Oh yeah. Um, that's the one, bro. Woo! That's it's unreal. I said on the thing, I played it. Uh, and I said, I shouted him out and I said, this feels like you're taking a cake and like unbaking it and then taking the ingredients and then rebaking something else. Absolutely. Um, and so you're like all of those same flavors and everything that you're familiar with is there. It's yeah. just a completely new thing. So tell me about street corner music, uh, what you're doing now. Um, 
the idea behind that because I know the the it ties in like you're saying with the original store. Um, yeah, yeah. Street Corner Music started uh, <clears throat> a little over ten years ago. Uh, I was still with the mother of my children at the time, and she was going to go back to school. So I was on daddy duty and I had to do something musically inclined at the crib to keep my sanity. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So that's when I started the gift series and what the gift series was, uh, it was the gift volume one through 10 and it was 10 beat tapes that I curated. Um, and we jacked the balloon on artwork and that shit was super yeah. fun. Um, yeah. I just always wanted to give light to the next guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, from JD on. I mean, this yeah. is the JD shit is 25, 30 years ago now almost. You know what I mean? I'm still yeah. doing the same thing. Black Milk, Quelle Chris, Rock Marciano, fucking Mach Hami, Danny Brown. You know, it's. I try to stay like 10 years ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and there's not a lot of rewards in it. <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> yeah being, being yeah. in the future while a lot of people try to live in the past is not that much is not very rewarding hmm. but it's personal i keep a super low ceiling on it um it was kind of a response to some kid making a beat and putting it on soundcloud and being happy with a little heart you know what i mean yeah and knowing that you know you could drop your hard drive and you have nothing yeah. And exi so existence is the main goal. Yeah. Like I said, it's kind of a low ceiling. I don't have time to be a, I'm not a record promoter, you know. Yeah. I'm not a salesman by any means. I give you a good meal, put it on the table, you can either eat or you can fucking go to walk to McDonald's. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, it's ultra personal. Uh, my business is always personal. People mm. say business never personal. Uh I'm judging you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> My business yeah. is always 100% personal. I want to give a kid a shot. I want yeah. to instill confidence in him and send him on his way. I don't own a stitch of the music on the label. I don't mm. sign contracts. We do handshakes. We sell half the records. You, we sell all the records. You get half the money. It's, it's that easy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want to give a kid his first record. I don't really fuck with established artists. There are some uh, exceptions to that on the label, but... Yeah, I deal with. I like singularities. Yeah, I like people that don't sound like nobody else. That most yeah. of them, for that reason, will probably never get a record. Yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah, it's it's been it's been what it's been. You yeah. know what I mean. Like I'm very grateful to provide the music, provide the opportunity to these kids, and let this music get into the world. Um. It's not a lot of celebrations, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's what's yeah. next. Okay, yeah. this is fun, like, because when you finally come to releasing an album, that's been something that's been underway for at least a year or two. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we can finally clean the plate and then we figure out what we're cooking next. Yeah. Um, what I love about Street Corner stuff is it feels uh, exclusive because it's i mean your website it's like records tapes some cds but most of it's not streaming um or is any of it streaming i don't know uh, well, um, the, for, the, for the first three years of the label nothing was on streaming mm. uh streaming is garbage uh <laughs> passive you know i'm a divisive person i talk my shit the truth the truth doesn't wear lace gloves <laughs> yeah <laughs> and streaming is passive support at best. Yeah. At, at, at its worst, it's grand larceny. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there was no streaming for the first three years. And then, you know, if something catches, it's just more money to do more things. It's more money for the kids to make. It's, you know, I have never taken yeah. a salary from Street Corner Music. Yeah. Street Corner Music pays my cell phone bill and my Wi Fi and maybe some other shit once in a while you know what i yeah. mean but i i love because it feels 
But like, streaming, that's what we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because streaming yeah. does feel so... Uh, well, it's all the, on the streams for the most part, except for, like, the Flip Sessions joints aren't on streaming. Yeah, yeah. And the projects that... The few projects that I released that were already prepared from other artists, like, just like I did with the Gift series, uh, I don't put out your shit. You know what I mean? Like, you can't yeah. just be like, here, shoes, put this out. No. Nah. Like, I catch wind of somebody and I hear something. Send me some folders. The folder transactions start going. I start making my folder out of those folders. We go from, you know, 200 beats to 20 beats. And then I yeah. sequence the album. I get the idea for the artwork. I, you know, it's mm. all I'm very heavy handed. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, streaming at the end of the day, you want to make, you want to put as much in their pockets as you can. You want to give them right. the best ride possible. Yeah. Because for some reason, the greatest creators, a lot of them are devastatingly lacking self-confidence. Mm. You know what I mean? Like the dopest yeah. ones are just fucking making heat. And they're like, yeah, I made that. You know what I mean? They have, no, yeah. they have very little confidence. So Let's fucking get a record under their belt, a real record. Like send them the, the some of the greatest moments I've had is, you know, <clears throat> I'm gonna send you your box of records. I want you to send me a video of you opening your first record. Mm. Yeah, like that's yeah. the type of shit that matters. You know what I mean? I've had yeah. people call me and tell me that you know they're they're crying with their mom right now, or mm. their uncle or some shit because they didn't believe in what I was doing, and now I showed them a record and they believe in it. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the shit that matters. Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, I don't know what the stat is exactly. It's something like every day, like Spotify, it's like, I don't know how many million new tracks are uploaded to Spotify. And then like how many of them just go completely unlistened. Yeah. It's just a, uh, a mess that also with, with Spotify in particular, it feels like uh, no matter I, I've I've played through my account, I'll play a playlist or something, or you know, put on a, an album and then it starts auto playing some stuff, what? or someone else's account, and it's just a completely different thing, and it kind of always ends up in the same place. Like there's stuff that they're pushing that I'm yeah. like, I don't want to listen to this, yeah. um, and so. It, a, a more highly curated thing like like you're doing it feels like a very exclusive much more honestly kind of like a saint andrews thing like you're playing the the new stuff still right. um right. and and putting people on to the stuff that they need to know um it's just a uh you know an elevated version of that well i mean um, a lot of djs and i'm sure a lot of people that work in the music industry don't care about music yeah it's not, like a lot of people that's confusing to them but it's like no nah, the music industry is an industry that i've seen more so than any other industry where people just fail up mm. they fail up and they don't become any more knowledgeable or better at their jobs as they fail up so you have people at the top of these companies who literally don't know fucking thing about music and you have yeah. djs that don't know shit about it's not personal they don't care. Yeah. They just want to have the best party and play the hottest shit for everybody. Yeah. I never give a fuck about none of that shit, man. <laughs> I yeah. want to play heat. I want to play you shit you've never heard in your fucking life and see you yeah. go up like you would off the hottest record in the fucking streets right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Tell me about Twitch. Cause how often do you stream on Twitch? Oh, way too much now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, uh, every couple days, I get a notification on my phone. I'm like, all right, the shoes house is open. All right, here we go. Well, I mean, at the least, if I'm in town, uh, Mondays, and I do magic. I call the show Magic. And that's crazy because that's, once again, I couldn't think of the name. What do I want my show to be called? Yeah. I saw a picture of Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson is my favorite basketball player of all time. And Magic... You know what I mean? Like, I went to see David Copperfield when I was a kid. Yeah. The ill shit about magic is it's, if you don't believe in it, it's worthless. 
You have to believe mm-hmm. in it for it to have some type of value. Yeah. So we do magic on Mondays and Wednesdays. I do eight hours on Mondays eight and Wednesdays. Eight hours. Yeah, I do. It was nine to five, but I do ten to six now. I sleep in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, that's that, no joke. Eight hours. Oh, it's fucking amazing. It began yeah. as just, you know, it began early pandemic, you know, my industry evaporated. Yep. Evaporated. And I did not get on Twitch trying to figure out how to support myself. I got on Twitch to figure out how to not hang my fucking self. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. the end of the fucking world. I mean, we got. The news that we're bombarded with every day is so devastating. And now we got like this COVID shit, which is as devastating as all that is cumulatively. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So Twitch was my escape. Yeah. Um, and I let people, you know, I'm going to get on here and play some records. I was doing the IG Live thing for a minute. And the funny thing is I never got popped on some copyright shit. I never got booted hmm. once. But they were like booting all the homies. Yeah. And that's another example of how greedy these fucking shit bags are, yo. Like, mm. how are you stopping DJs from playing your records? You used to pay us to play your records. Right. We used to yeah, get right paid now. to play their records. They would show up at the club with like a bottle and fucking, you know, clothes. Like, they would lace us to make sure we were playing their fucking records. And now you're shutting us down because we're playing your records? Like, yeah. it's free promotion, you fucking idiot. Yeah. Like, how are you not allowing us? How are you not allowing somebody with three followers, 300, 300,000, 30 million? It's yeah. all the same shit. It's free promo, man. They're exposing your products. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a commercial for a fucking new pair of Nikes. Every time they right. play your record, whether they put it in the back of their video or whatever, I never understood that. So I got hot because they were clipping all the homies. And I went to Twitch. And like the first day, it was like 30 people showed up. And it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. You know what I mean? And now I'm damn near, I'd rather play at the crib than in a club. Because yeah. Twitch has paid the rent for like a year and a half. Oh, wow. Yeah. Without well, you got- like just completely organic. Yeah. I'm not. That's. That's I'm not great. begging for shit. You know what I mean? Like I'm on yeah. here playing heat. We go like, you know, we're experiencing things in the last three, like, you know, busted shit came out finally. And I records that I, that I've been looking forward to. I wait, I wait and we listen to them together. You know that's, what I mean? Like, that's amazing. Yeah. It's fucking, it's the greatest thing. And my community that I've, that I've, you know, I just cracked 12,000 yesterday. Oh, which is crazy. Congrats. And, there's no dumb shit. I think in three yeah. years, three in three years and like three months, I've blocked like maybe five people. Mm. Like there's no dumb shit in the chat. Everybody's a fucking sweetheart, super respectful. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a really good that's, place. That's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the internet. It's a, like a double edged sword because. There's stuff that they got to figure out, like uh, shut. I feel like they need to figure out some way. And if Twitch is that, like they need to figure out some way to bring uh, the craft of DJing into the internet because that is a thing that is uh, is difficult. Like some people, like you're saying, don't know or care about music, right. but then those that do, like DJing, not just like playing whatever but playing with stuff with intention and right uh new stuff and everything that you're all about like that is crucially important um and that's amazing being able to build a a a community of people who show up and are like yeah like what do you got to play this is which is uh more than you could do like if you're at at a physical spot because you're you know, you have however many people that place can fit or whatever. Well, but if you can yeah, go I mean, global with it. Yeah. I mean, I, and also people, the, some of the homies are like, man, how can you play eight hours? And I'm like, how can you not play eight hours, bro? <laughs> like, you ain't got shit else to do. 
I'm just getting started at the three hour point, yo. You know what I mean? Like, I've been doing this shit for 30 years. I still got to have, like, I only drink when I DJ for the most part mm. because I, I, I don't want to think. Yeah. Like, the thing, my brain gets in the way. You know what I mean? And when I was 19, I got hired at St. Andrews Hall to play for like 500 fucking people every Friday night. Right. And it's like, man, give me a drink. Give me another drink. Give me another drink. It's always been about just us having, I'm not a technical DJ yeah, by any means at all. I never practiced. So once I got my shit together, the gigs were the practice. I would gig often. And that would yeah. be the, pra- I, you know, it's like riding a bike. Time is yeah. all, all that matters for me. You know, mm-hmm. like, Shit's got to be in time. Long blends in Detroit are what matters. Cuts were never a big thing. I mean, you had DJs in Detroit that could cut their fucking ass off, but Detroit was about like long, clean, extended blends. Hmm. And once, so once you got that locked in, that's the most important thing. Once I get a bunch of whiskey in me, I might pull some cuts out. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, Oh, what do you got? What do you got coming up? I know you're you're at Largo too now. Um, well, I've been at Largo for like ten years now. Shout to uh, oh ten years. Oh shoot. Okay. I mean, it's you know, it's another secret. Largo's yeah. a secret. Largo. Largo is an amazing place that yeah. feels like it hasn't been ruined yet. Right. Um, because it it's amazing. Be. It never yeah. will be. Because the ownership, yeah. like the ownership and the management, like that's a venue. From top to bottom, from the from the owner to the fucking uh, valets to the bartenders to every you know everybody's cool as fuck. Yeah, everybody. You know what I mean? Um, no computers. You got to play mm. records. No pedestrian shit. The instructions when I started DJing there is fuck the crowd. You play mm. for staff and management. That's- and we don't want to hear regular shit. We don't yeah. want to hear like Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd's pedestrian. They they know it. Yeah. They want to hear records they haven't heard before. That's exactly what you're there to do. That's amazing. Yeah. So shout to Fat Albert Einstein. He uh he's been kind of holding down the music end of things there for probably damn near twenty years since it was on Fairfax. Yeah. When Kanye was showing up, you know, doing fucking right. graduation with John yeah. Bryan. Like that yeah. the first time I went to Largo was Chris, that's Fat Albert Einstein. He told me about the John Bryan shows. He would do these one man. I've shows. been to the John Bryan show. Yeah, in like I think it was two thousand six or two thousand seven. Yeah, um, unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah, and it's amazing that even now that place, like they'll have musicians or comedians uh, that are unbelievably talented, or also. Like you would pay to see them, like oh, yeah. huge deals, like 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 Mulaney. I know you you just posted about this. Like, well, see, the, the uh, crazy Mulaney's thing is just, there. just to explain to people what Largo is. Largo yeah. is the crossroads of like <clears throat> singer songwriter music uh, and comedy. Yeah, and they're like an asset to that community and that community ends up being an asset to them at the same time. Yeah. And like, you know, say if, I mean, from Russell Brand to Neil Brennan to John Mulaney, uh, if a comedian has a, has something he's working on a new, he's got to go on the road for a tour or there's a new special coming up. Like Mulaney's Mulaney's there like half the month. This, That's this month, amazing. Yeah. this month he's doing five nights with two shows each night. And wow. he's popping up as a guest. I've already seen him like guest guest like five times this month on other people's shows. So he's working on all this new material and it's fucking amazing seeing them hone their craft and Yeah. Then you see it the finished product on Netflix or fucking Hulu yeah. or Prime, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really that's a really cool place. That's uh amazing that uh, that that's the perfect gig for you as well. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Um yeah. Uh, what do you got? Uh, what do you got on the calendar? I know you just you were just out on the road, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I sat down till the end on COVID. A lot of homies mm. jump back. I mean, everybody's got to pay their bills and shit. I'm, I'm not trying to kill somebody for a party, right? 
So, yeah, I mean, I just started getting off planes again literally like last month. Okay. Yeah, Dante's High Five. Shout out to my brother Rich Medina. Uh, man, Miami and Austin, unbelievable. Hmm. Like hearing your records on some real yeah, hi-fi yeah. system with people that are there to hear hi-fi music on a hi-fi system. It's just the vibration is – fucking so incredible it's unbelievable really yeah. really put a battery in my back i get mm. low sometimes because like i yeah. feel you know my whole job is to put batteries in people's backs that's mm. always been my job since i started fucking around in this mu- like 30 years ago in this music shit giving homies records to make me you know going over jay's house bringing him records to fuck with like inspiring fellow creatives that's all i've yeah. ever been doing you know what I mean? Yeah. So the Dante's high five shit had me so charged up. And then going to mm. Detroit and doing the Riesling study with Soil Pimp uh, and finding out that I was playing dinner service like at the last minute. And I was like, oh, we ain't playing no rap shit. I'm going to crush these motherfuckers with like the <laughs> best song, the best music that I have. Not to say that mm. rap shit ain't the best music in my computer. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's play some fucking heat. I'm gonna go to the you know my rips, my Serato rips when I rip my records that I have from vinyl. I played all out of oh, that yeah. folder. It was fucking unbelievable. I and I realized I'd much yeah. rather do gigs like that. But there's no gigs like that. Yeah. There's no dinner party right. gig with a bag <laughs> attached. You know what I mean? I would gladly do it. I would gladly do it. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Well, yeah. Four parties in Detroit in four <laughs> days. Blurry as fuck. I think I lost like twelve to three every night. I got like ten to twelve, and like after mm. three, with that twelve to three spot, it's just not here. Yeah. <laughs> the whiskeys. <laughs> <laughs> but then the the super wild shit is a homie hits me up like. Six months ago, like, you want to do the Saugatuck City Fireworks on the 4th of July? And I'm like, what's the bag? What, like, what state like, is that? It's yeah, Michigan. It's on the west coast of Michigan. It's on Lake okay. Michigan. It's like if you if you went east from Detroit in a straight line, it's like an hour east of Grand Rapids. Okay, gotcha. And it was a good bag. It was a really good bag. And, you know, the population of Saugatuck is a thousand people. They got four <laughs> cops. <laughs> it was unbelievable, man. Hanging out with the city manager, got, met the mayor, like bumped the mayor over, had him jump on the turntables real quick on the 4th of July. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> fucking just the one-on-one, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Well, especially like you're saying, like you know, being inside for so long, uh, that that's amazing. Get to, yeah, getting man. to connect with people directly like that. Yeah, it was great. It was really good, and definitely a different experience. Like a thousand people. I knew it was a small city. I thought it was maybe like yeah. I don't know, 20,000, 50,000, 1,000 people. <laughs> Super crazy, man. I guess Saugatuck that's over awesome. the years, over like the last maybe. 50 60 years has been like a, a lgbtq getaway also so oh, okay the, the wild shit is i get into the city and i'm talking to the city manager and i'm like so it's like a liberal city huh like it's i've heard about how it's like an lgbtq getaway and he's like no it's not a liberal city because <laughs> hmm. i like, yeah, it's just all about economics because huh. it's a because it's a destination place if they have no all their fucking economy relies on visitors yeah yeah you know what i mean yeah it's interesting interesting conversations that i have yeah you gotta talk to people when you're on the road you know what i mean yeah that's that's the the most interesting part i mean we could talk about some dad shit maybe if you got like you know what i mean (laughs) let's do it let's do it that's you know no one really ever talks about that shit. It's always just yeah. about the music. And it's like, you know, most of us are fathers. Yeah. So uh, that's always a good conversation, too. How yeah, old, how old are you? 
you got one child? So I got uh, I got one. I got a six year old son, and then I got my wife is pregnant. Her due date is August first. Oh, word! So oh, we're like getting down to the wire. Yeah, Boy, um, a, girl? a girl. Nice. Oh, match yeah. pair. Yeah. And then we're done so, after that, right? That's what yeah, I, I was that's like. Yeah, that's, yeah, girl. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, you're right. Like it's, I, I do love getting to talk to other creative people and then especially dads and be, and then, you know, yeah, we're on the same page. Like we're, we're all doing the same thing. Yeah. Like, they're, playing, they're probably playing like fucking castle crashers in the other room right now. So yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like I, yeah, my, my six year old, I just put him down to, uh, to go to bed and then, yeah. And then I'm texting you and I'm like, all right, here we go. Yep. Uh, so yeah. How old are, how old are your kids? Uh, my son is 14. He starts high school in the fall. Oh, wow. Jesus. And my daughter will be 11 uh, next month. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Yeah, my son's uh, my son's name is James Deshaun Buchanan. Mm. My son is uh, named after Dylan Proof. <laughs> that's that's amazing. I love yeah. that. And my daughter's name is Eliana Javon Buchanan, and she's named after like a Spanish play on my mother's name. And <clears throat> Javon is a another homie of mine that passed away. Uh, DJ J One, yeah. the deer. And I just felt it played. It's a beautiful name. It works for for a girl too. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you this then on on dad stuff because like so I've been uh, a musician, like professional musician. That's my thing. Like bass DJ, uh, and then the channel is a, a more recent thing. Right. Um, but I've been me and my wife have been together for almost eleven years, uh, and she's also a musician. Um, so like okay, we've so that's lived. How, that's how it works. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn, 11 years, bro. And then you said that. I was like, oh, you lucky motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, that's the thing is like, we're on an opposite schedule from like the rest of the world. And right. I know this is a thing that, that you know. And then my son this last year was in kindergarten, which is like regular person schedule Monday through Friday, which right. we have not lived that ever. Right. And so it's been very like jarring trying to figure out like, and I'm getting back late and then, you know, I got to get up early with him first thing yep. in the morning. Cause, cause he's up. I got to get him to school, the whole thing. Yep. Uh, does that, what is that balance like as they get older? Uh, does that, does that get easier or is that, that tension? Oh, it, no, there? it definitely gets easier. You know, they get, they, they gradually become more independent. Um, yeah, I mean, shit. Jane, he James made his own breakfast today. He made mm. like eggs and sausage and shit. Like, I was ready to make breakfast. He already had it done. Yeah. Um, it's amazing, man. You just got to take a lot of pictures and take a lot of video. Yeah. Because it goes so fast, you know. One thing that's been coming up in a lot of conversations is, I try. I, I'm trying to look on the brighter side of things because a lot of shit that's happened has been on the darker side of things. Mm. And I feel like time is my enemy. Mm. And I'm, I really want to figure out how to make time my friend. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I have no fucking idea how to do it, but I'm going to yeah. try to figure it out. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's you know, it's the, I mean, we're, it's the reason that we're on this fucking planet. Yeah, is to create our replacements and hopefully raise them up to be at least slightly better than us. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, I love it. I, I'm so grateful. And, it, yeah. you know, me and the mother of my children split years ago. And then, you know, you just really learn how to grow the fuck up, I think. Yeah. As much of a child as I still am, oh my God, if I didn't have kids, holy <laughs> shit. Oh my Same. God. Yeah, I couldn't yeah, yeah. imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do your kids do music? Uh, they're both musically inclined. My, I just got my son a drum set. Um, well, actually, it's a crazy story. <clears throat> he told me last fall. Uh, that he wanted to play drums because a couple of his homies 
you know, one of his homies plays guitar and the other one plays bass. And they got amps and shit and they want to do a band. Um, so I knew, I knew Amir, I knew Questlove had this pocket kit, this starter drummer kit. Yeah, but then when yeah, I yeah. looked it up, it said it was for like four to 10 year olds. Mm. So I hit Amir up and I was like, what's the best kit that I can get for my son? Um, he wants to play drums. Uh, he's 14. Yeah. And Amir's like, he sends me his assistant's email and he's like, uh, send her an address. I'll send him a breakbeats kit this week. Like a fucking five hundred dollar drum kit. <laughs> that's that's amazing. So my son got a drum kit from fucking Quest Love. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh man. <laughs> Yo, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I love it. It's that is crazy. crazy. That's better that's than awesome. anything. That, you know, that's that's when it really gets serious. Like you think it's good getting like a promo ahead of time. Like, right. Fucking Quest Love sending your son a drum kit. That makes right. me feel damn near better than I felt getting any record in my life. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's amazing. What's your son like? What's he? Is he into music? Yeah, uh, he. Yeah, he's, he's just started piano lessons. There we uh, go. He's getting in on that, uh, and then yeah, I mean, I try to get him on as much music as possible uh we play a game of the car where i'll just like i'll put on something new and i'll be like thumbs up or thumbs down and right. you know we'll play we'll play 30 seconds of it and he'll be like nah thumbs down <laughs> all right we'll skip it what were you what, <laughs> were, then, what were you super excited to play for him that he thumbs down uh um i don't know let me look at what i played him today i gotta look it up Let's see. Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of. Uh, well, it actually, it started. I played him um, today. I played him. Uh, Can I kick it? The tribe song. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, "What is this?" And I'm like, "Dude, this is a tribe called Quest. Come on." And so then he's like, "Okay." And he's like, kind of like thumbs in the middle. And I'm yeah. like, do you know what? Do you know what it means to like kick it? And he's like, no. And so I like explain it to him. He's like, that doesn't make any sense. I, I'm thinking yeah. of like kicking something. I'm like, no. What? And so anyway, by the end of it, he's he's singing along with the call and response. Okay. Like, yes, you okay. can. There so, we go. Yeah. Uh, but he's got a, a a portable CD player. Like I'm I'm trying to go old school. Uh, so I buy him I buy him CDs all the time. Oh, that's um, crazy. Yeah, so he's he's coming up like also the the importance of albums. Uh so like he's got he's got off the wall um like he's wearing out. He's got the Earth Wind of Fire best of. Fire. He's wearing out. Um yeah, I'm trying to like go old school with some of that stuff cuz yeah. a lot of parents too. I mean, you probably know this. A lot of parents will be like Coco Melon or like you know daniel tiger or whatever and i gotta listen to that so like i can't i can't do that so like yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna give him i kind of want to go through like chronologically music history that's kind of what i'm doing is like let's start with some old classic stuff and yeah. like move move through as you get older like I'll, I'll get you more and more stuff wow um that makes sense that makes a lot but, of sense yeah because that's the other thing is with streaming is there's like no there's so much stuff the it's impossible to choose what to listen to right and then as soon as you start you're like oh but i could listen to this <laughs> yeah and it's just impossible to to stick with something right yeah I'm, i don't do it are you on, are you on any streaming service i don't or do, stream, do you pay for I have no subscription to any streaming service at all I got fucking 8,000 records at the crib. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And, and uh, like a terabyte of music, probably multiple terabytes of music. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I ain't listened to this, like probably 75% of this shit I ain't listened to in fucking 15 years. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to go back into that. Like if I get in the car, I got a tape deck and a CD player in the car. Yeah. 
Um, the infamous does not leave my CD player. Yep. And it hasn't for since it came out, since I had a car with a CD player, if there's a, definitely if there's a changer, the infamous has been in my car for fucking 25 years. Yeah. That's my singular most favorite hip hop album of all time. Fuck it. At hip hop, like all yeah. genres. Well, let me ask you this then. Uh, uh, Cause I've, I've played this game. Uh, this is a, a difficult game to figure out it's like desert island like six cd changer uh, you know like the the old like you have the cartridge and you put the six discs in yeah uh so that's all you get for the rest of your life six discs you put them in yeah. uh what what are your so infamous is is one of them infamous uh floating points elenia that's my that's my desert album. I call that my desert album. Like when I travel, if I get on a plane and I yeah. want to sleep, it soothes me. I put it on repeat. I go to sleep. Um, so that's two. Uh, probably uh, Verakai. Hmm. Arthur Verakai album. That's three. Uh, man. Mm, voodoo. Yep. Uh, that's three, or is that four? Uh, four with voodoo, yeah. Four. Okay, two more. Shit. <laughs> uh, Mad Villainy. Oh, uh, yeah. And probably fucking hard to earn, man. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You're bringing it back to the, the your roots. That's amazing. Yeah. That's perfect. I just fucking love that record so much. That's the greatest intro to any hip hop album of all time to me. Yeah. And just man, them cuts. Like as dope as the beats were, like when hard to earn came, like Primo was kind of on it on Daily Operation, but when hard to earn dropped, like that was like the birth to me of just super scratch hooks like that. Yeah. Like an album with like fuck hooks, we just get cuts. Yeah, they were so sharp. Oh man! And then like at the end of fucking uh, Code of the Streets, the Q-tip shit. Yeah. I would, oh my god! It was just, uh yeah, man. Rest in peace, Guru, man. Yeah. It's a shame yeah. that nobody ever got to Solar. Hmm. It's a shame that nobody ever got to him because that that was what that's probably like the most disparaging death, in my opinion, yeah. of our greats. Like murder is fucked up, but like what happened with Guru was just it was so gross, and for us yeah. to watch all that shit happen, to see it happening, and then for him to pass, oh, what, how devastating! Yeah, what a legend. Then you go in like okay, I remember like ten years ago and on the okay player boards, they were like saying that guru was like one of the worst rappers ever or some shit. It's like, man, like you gotta take a breath. Yeah. You don't want to be like, fuck the kids, <laughs> but sometimes you're just like, man, fuck the kids, yo. Like <laughs> you're never going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we all become our parents. Yeah, it was it I, always used it always used to be better we used to think that was bullshit I, but i know i know i'm i'm true. i'm noticing that transition with myself i'm like oh. i'm trying not to be like the the angry old guy that's like no nah, it was better before but in a lot of ways like it was <laughs> it actually was yeah yeah i think the key is just to not be you know I don't feel like some people try to give me that grumpy old man or the, the man on the lawn, the guy on the lawn shit. Like I say it with a smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not trying to start, arguing. you know, the epiphany that I came to a few years ago was like, man, all these fucking hip hop, these rap album arguments and all this shit, like to come to realize that we're never actually arguing about the music you're right you're arguing with somebody about how something makes them feel you're right and they're arguing with you about how it makes you feel 
and it's cool to have discourse, but man, fuck that. Fuck yeah. arguing about music. And then I took it a step further and I was like, man, like fuck arguing with anybody on the internet about anything. Yeah. I re- yeah. Uh, after 2020 especially, I really Whoa. got over that. Jesus. I was like, no, nah, I'm I can't do this anymore. Yeah. 2016. Oh, it's, yeah. That's, <laughs> you know that's, I mean? that's when it started for sure, yeah. Man, should we tell the secret service story or has that already been washed on the internet enough? Uh no, I I don't know if I know it. Oh wait, oh, oh, secret service. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh yes, please do. Please secret do. Secret story, right? Yeah. <laughs> So since we're, you know, vaguely talking about Trump 2016, um, I was, you know, they always say, don't talk about sports, don't talk about politics. And it's like, man, don't be a, don't be a pussy. Like, talk about shit that matters to you. I'm not, I'm not having like politician discussions all the time, but like, I'm going to say that. Donald Trump is a piece of shit. Because, yeah. <laughs> duh, if we can't mean? do that, then what are we doing? Yeah. Bro, it's like, come on. People are so soft and like so scared to stir the pot and like, you know, put a ripple in the pond. Fuck that. Yeah. Um, he's a shit bag. And <laughs> I would always get triggered with just, you know, the lack of a response from my constituents. Yeah. Um, I mean, if this was like the 80s, I was tripping on the fact that there was never like Trump dead on an album. Like no one did that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this, this was the 80s and the 90s. There would have been multiple records with some form of him. Yeah. In some advanced state of decomposition. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. It was maybe like 2018 or 17, there was this Native American dude who was at uh, Arlington National Cemetery Hmm. and he was performing a ceremony that he performs every year and a bus of students from Covington High School showed up with MAGA hats on. Right. And this shit has been spun so many different ways. They said that they got harassed by some black Israelites. It's like, bitch, you're wearing MAGA hats. Like, <laughs> catch that. Like, take that, take that, motherfucker. Yeah. But I'm a white dude. You're a white dude. Yeah. You see the pictures of these kids mocking and smirking at this fucking Native American dude. Yeah. A Native American right. who have been, you know what I mean? Like, you, this right. was their place. This was their land. And they've taken more shit than anybody. Yeah. And I blacked the fuck out. Mm. And this was, this is when I was in my Twitter fucking prime. Like, I used to just talk shit. I would, like, set the table with some shit I would say, and I would just sit down and light candles and wait. Like, let's go. I want to <laughs> go. I want to go. Let's go for it tonight. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I blacked out, and when I came to it, was like seven or twelve tweets or something. I was definitely in Twitter jail for a few days. I think I said, "Lock the kids in the school and burn it to the ground." Um, the shit that set shit off though was fight. Like I said, something like fire on all the red hat bitches. <laughs> <laughs> now you know. Our era knows that when you say fire on somebody, it means punch them in their face. It doesn't mean you're on a rooftop with a high-powered right. rifle with a scope on it. You know what I mean? <clears throat> yeah. And they dox my address. I had people calling my phone, talking about they're going to kill me. I'm like, word, you call somebody before you say you're going to kill them? That's fucking, <laughs> that's crazy. It's courtesy call, Yeah. <laughs> It was. It, I enjoyed it. I had a ball. You know what I mean. Um, and I get home from the record shop on a Monday. I used to work at this record shop uh, in Santa Monica called Record Surplus that Fat Albert Einstein actually owns now, which is crazy. Hmm. Um, and there was a card, a business card, in the door from Major Crimes LAPD, and on the back it said. Uh, Give us a call. We got some questions for you. 
It's like 12 o'clock at night. I'm not doing it right now. I wake up the next morning. I have my coffee with a little splash of whiskey in it. I'm on the porch. I smoke a little like half a joint. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm kind of buzzed up. I'm going to hop in the shower real quick, get my mind right. We're going to call these guys, and we're going to talk about it. And as I'm walking from my balcony through the living room, there's a knock at the door. And it's a it's a major crimes knock. <laughs> you know when the cops You know immediately, you know I mean? yeah. So I answered the door. It's two uh, uniformed major crimes detectives. We talk in the hallway for about, I don't it might have been 10 minutes. And what it basically came down to was, did you really want to kill anybody? Did you really say you wanted people to get killed? And I was like, nah. Like, You're right. I talked to both of them. I was like, you guys know what the fuck it means when you say fire on somebody. Like, yeah, we know. But we, you know, we're just doing our job. Yeah. They leave. The next morning, same time, same knock. Uh, FBI. Wow. <laughs> they wanted to come inside. Yeah. Uh, they wanted to sit at the table. I was like, well, we can go outside. I can smoke some cigarettes while you're talking to me. So we're on my balcony talking. Pretty much the same exact conversation. Might have been a couple minutes longer. Did you really mean you wanted to kill everybody? No, I really didn't want to kill everybody. Yeah. They left. Two days later, same time, same night. And I was on the balcony. And I literally remember being like, fuck. Major crimes. I'm walking through my living room. I'm like, major crimes. FBI. This is going to be the fucking Secret Service. In my head. I said that to myself yeah, before I answered yeah. the door. Answered the door. Secret Service. Come on in, guys. I talked to all your homies this week. <laughs> unbelievable oh, man uh, it was like a a younger black dude maybe like mid 30s early 30s and this big goony ball-headed white dude looked like a bouncer you yeah. know what i mean he didn't say much <laughs> seemed like he would just put you in the sleeper like real quick if anything right, like yeah. left yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're talking the same conversation for like five minutes. <clears throat> and then they interrupt me and they're like, we're not here about that Twitter situation. Uh, we're here about this record you put out with Donald Trump dead on the cover. <laughs> and I was like, oh, word. <laughs> and it was literally <laughs> displayed at that time. Yeah. I grabbed the record off the shelf and I'm like, you see this record? This record sold out faster than any record I ever put out. The front cover is a picture of Trump on the ground, bleeding out. Technically, he could have, you know, spilled wine on himself. You don't know if he's dead. And there's like a, a sleeved hand with the pistol in it in the mm -hmm. foreground. The back cover is like a Secret Service, a close-up of like a Secret Service agent with his finger to his ear, and there's like the earpiece and shit. Yeah. So the insinuation is like, you know, inside job maybe that you know yeah 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 i flipped the cover over i'm like look you guys are on the back cover <laughs> <laughs> and i look at both of them on my kids and i go your boss is a cocksucker <laughs> and they go their immediate response is we can't discuss our personal opinions mm. but then it kind of turned into more of an interrogation. It got much more pointed, you know, what's your education history? What's your mental health history? Uh, mm. You know, blah, blah, blah. And we all kind of have this story. We all have our story that we kind of just press play on for strangers. Yeah. yeah it's like, yeah. you're not even saying it when you're saying it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I went to school, didn't work out. I started producing, making beats, uh, Putting out records, DJing. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Jay Dilla. Put out Jay Dilla's first record. And the young dude interrupts me. And he goes, well, it's still so ridiculous to this day. Fucking Secret Service agent. Wait, 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 wait. You put out Dilla's first record? And I walked like 
three steps over and pull it off the shelf and hand it to him. Like, <laughs> this is house shoes records. I'm house shoes. You guys know that already. <laughs> and then after that, it's like, you know, fanboy shit, pictures. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's... Like, <laughs> I thought I was oh. gonna die. I thought I was gonna die when they left. When they left, <laughs> I started laughing so hard, like just like, "Are you fucking kidding me, yo?" You know what I mean? Like, I thought I was gonna have to go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Major man. crimes: the FBI and the Secret Service in four days, and Dilla put them all to bed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, I know we said, I, I said I didn't really want to go super Dilla, but it is crazy how he has guided, you know, just a lot of shit that's happened. You know, he got me out of that. Yeah. That's right. I, mean, I wouldn't have my, I moved to Detroit. I mean, I moved here from me. I was supposed to move to New York. Wajid mm. had been talking me into moving to New York in 2006. Yeah. And I went to New York and. He was he DJed the donuts release party at Joe's Pub, and I actually met a girl that I was in like a three year three year relationship with that night. Hmm. Um, and it was a great night, and I was staying at Big Tone's crib. He was living in New York at the time in Brooklyn. Woke up the next morning, went to Fat Beats to buy donuts because it came out that day. I already had the shit on vinyl, but I was like, let's get the numbers up. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Went to Fat Beats, bought the record, walked down those exorcist, the exorcist staircase of Fat Beats, New York. And as soon as my foot hit the concrete, uh, YG called me. It was like, he's gone. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And he was like, he got super urgent. I understood. Mm. And me and Tone cried on the sidewalk for like an hour and a half. And then yeah. I got on a plane to go to the funeral. And the night of the funeral, uh, at the funeral, Tarak was like, I'm bringing a bag of records tonight. We're going to do something at this place called uh, the Little Temple, which was on Santa Monica and Virgil. Now it's known as uh, Little Temple. No, now yeah. it's the Virgil. Okay. Yeah, it was the Little Temple. And it was like Eric Coleman, Tarak, and a few other people just playing shit. And everyone's fucking miserable because Dilla's dead. Yeah. And uh, I remember going up to Coleman and being like, Jay wants me to play some records. Hmm. And I don't, I took another, I think Rhett Maddock gave me a, a double shot of Hennessy. It was probably like the ninth double shot of Hennessy I had. I don't remember any of the rest of the night. Yeah. Uh, they said I was crying the whole time I was DJing. Hmm. Beat junkies, all the illest motherfuckers on stage watching. And the next day, me and YG met up for lunch. And he was like, man, I know we were talking that New York shit. But you fucking whooped this city's ass last night. Hmm. And two months later, Proof died. And two months after that, I was living in Los Angeles. Yeah. My children were born in Los Angeles. Street Corner yeah. Music was started in Los Angeles. I never would have even been here. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Grateful. Super grateful, man. That was my fucking man. Yeah. That's amazing hearing about, uh, like, working through the grief of his death through records. And, like, that's, that's the language that y you guys all speak. So, like, it's a, a really that's really uh really special that's really moving like i mean that was the first of many you know what i mean yeah, but that was yeah. yeah it's fucked up to say but it's like i'm good at that like in moments of grief you're supposed to feel all the feelings you're not supposed yeah. to guard yourself you know what i mean like that's yeah. in real time you owe it to yourself and to the party that's not here anymore to feel all them fucking feelings. Right. And that's some shit that we've done over and over again. I want to, I want to make a motherfucker cry when it matters. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. 
And that's an amazing thing to be able to do through music and through, through DJing right. that Absolutely. that's like, yeah, that's like, it's such a, it's such a high art to be able to do and such a, uh, craft that's amazing that yeah like like i've been saying with with streaming stuff we're like bringing dj stuff which is why i love like you're like all in on twitch yeah. like you know you're doing eight hour sets it's, because it became fight or flight yeah that's what it became i mean that's that's how it started it was like yeah it was an escape and <clears> it became something where like if some something shitty happened during the day i'm jumping on twitch yeah you know what I mean? Like it was my yeah. escape. Start pouring coffees and whiskeys and just feel music makes me feel good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And making yeah. other people feel good with music makes me feel even better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like I was doing a show for Lefto for a few years. He has this program called uh, the Outsiders Program on Kiosk Radio. It's like his, his platform. And I decided to tap out of the show after a few years. And the last show that I did was the funeral of the show, but the music that I want played. I, I didn't. I didn't say that publicly. Like the name of the yeah. show was. I, I titled it the closer, but mm. I made a mix for my own funeral. Wow. You know what I mean? Wow. And it's yeah. I'm gonna have it on a fucking flash drive somewhere. It's gonna be in a space where that's what gets played because I don't want anybody in control of the fucking music of my friend. Right. And it's fucking yeah. heavy. <laughs> it's heavy. <laughs> heavy, man. <laughs> Gotta make them motherfuckers cry. <laughs> How long is the set? Uh it's a sixty minute set. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you go on, if you go on, I think I don't think I I might have uploaded it. I didn't upload it on mine. If you search "How Shoes the Closer" kiosk radio, it should pop up. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna have to check yeah. it out. Yeah, but it's heavy. <laughs> kiosk radio. Yeah, I'm bookmarking that for later. Yeah, but that's then also, amazing. You know, from like pod, like Podomatic. That was my first like heavyweight heavyweight gallery. Tyler and Max. They asked me to come play. They had a barbecue every Sunday, and they would have a DJ do a mix. And I had never done a podcast mix or shared, yeah, any mixes online. This is like 2007, and I found a link to the old Podomatic account. It's man, fuck, I was putting, and there was like I did a post on Instagram with a link to the original Podomatic account because there's still like 17 mixes on it, and. It was really a moment in time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that got me, you know, I got the Mixcloud account. I got like 150 mixes on the Mixcloud. We got mixes mm. on SoundCloud and all that. Yeah. But it's just an archive. You know what I mean? It's yeah. I, I would do like year end episodes that would be like six hours long with all my favorite music from the year. And then we do like a, a no hip hop episode. Mm. those would get a lot of traction because people would be like, damn, Shoes, I thought you was just a rap guy. People just right, want you to right. be one thing for some reason. Yeah. It's yeah. really disappointing. You know what I'm saying? I know. I know. Well, you can do yeah. two things. You can do three things. <laughs> Multidimensional? Yeah. Oh, my exactly. God. Crazy. Yeah, that's cool to have it archived like that because, yeah, like there's something very special about it being in the moment and – once it's there, it's gone, which is a lot of music uh, and, and especially like either live music or a live DJ set, but being able to have an archive like that, where like you're saying, like the, uh, the closer mix set, like that's, that's powerful. It's heavy, see, it's funny because when I DJ, uh, I don't prepare for the most part, mm. like in person, I'm going to get like three or four. So I might make a folder with like 300 songs in there, but yeah. I open the computer up five minutes before I'm DJing and I pick like the first three songs and then we're off to the races. So mm -hmm. a lot of the longer shows on those sites are kind of like that. But then when you have the shorter mixes and especially like the mixes that are for other people, 
that yeah. are like one hour or two hours. There's much more intention. Yeah. So they might be a little bit more special. And like the late night streams on Twitch, when I do the late night shit with the red light bulb, it's a lot more intention than when I just wake up in the morning and put a pot of coffee on and just start playing joints. The late night shit yeah. is the late night shit is fire because it's like yeah. a, trying to sustain that nighttime vibration. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Energy mad low, but really yeah. powerful music. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, working. Man. I'm working for y'all. I love you know, it. I've always I been working it. for y'all. I'm a worker. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. How big is your... Are you, are you uh, Serato? I was one of the last people to go to Serato. But I mean, as you see, okay. I mean, there's seven, 8,000 yeah. records in the crib. How do you and split between... Like the Dante's trip, the Dante's Miami and uh, Austin... Yeah, I was kind of shook at first because I I haven't traveled. I mean, to keep it a buck, I'm way more comfortable DJing on the computer yeah. than I am with records. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Even yeah, though I yeah, DJ yeah. with records way longer than I've been on Serato, it's just much more convenient. It's a lot easier to be better on <laughs> Serato. <laughs> you know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. But pulling yeah. out my heat for Austin and, and Miami and seeing the reaction of people and just, man, like as dope as Miami was, uh, Austin, which is now closed. That was just like a year long pop-up at Soho mm. house, man. Holy shit. I have never heard records sound as good as they sounded. And at, mm. at the Dante's pop-up in Austin, Miami was dope, but like, Three records into my set in Austin, I was like, my the rest of my set is going to be completely informed by the records yeah. that I want to hear on this on system. This. For the rest of the night. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fucking playground. Yeah. Unbelievable. So yeah, I'm. Yeah. I, I I would love to play more of those kind of rooms, and to have it not be such a. I mean, it could be a party, but not so concerned on up-tempo party energy like come see somebody right. play the best records that they have in their collection and you might not be able yeah. to fucking do a dance routine to them but yeah might be one of the but best it's its own in your life you know what i mean yeah yeah it's its own art it's its own statement that you're making that's separate from yeah the the party vibe like you're talking about the uh, i forget the name of the the place across from St. Andrews. That's like uh, the, the more like, you legends. know, playing the radio stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Um, what do you think about what's, what's new stuff, newer music that's not on street corner that you're, uh, that you're digging. Whenever I get those kind of questions, I got to look because yeah. my mind always goes blank. Yeah. <laughs> so let me look at the downloads. We'll go through my downloads folder real quick. Let's see. Alright. Well, I mean, one of my favorite rappers of the last few years, maybe like the last five, six years, Billy Woods. Okay. Uh the maps record with Kenny Siegel's fucking incredible um i love quelle um i was a little late on rome streets you know griselda is griselda's great um you know compared to what we compared to what everyone's listening to like it's it's one of the greatest uh collectives that uh are still have that Intring, intring, you know, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but it, it comes from the root. You know what I mean? Yeah. Primary yeah. shit. Um, Alchemist has been killing shit for the last five years. Yeah. And what an incredible example, you know, just to walk away from all that shit and to do yeah. exactly what you want to fucking do. I saw the, the thing on your story today, your Instagram yeah. uh, clip of him talking. Yeah. And like these, you know, making his own 
he, I think he said uh, boutique he's called himself like a microbrewery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you yeah. seen? Have you ever seen that full piece? It's like forty minutes. It's great. Oh, I haven't. I haven't. I gotta look it up. Yeah, that idea hmm. generation with uh, what's his name Noah Callahan Beaver. Yeah, yeah. He does. Yo, those are incredible. Super yeah. good. Super good. Um, I really like Lord Juco. Toronto's been killing shit for the last mm. four or five years. They got a whole squad of motherfuckers. Um, yeah. Daniel Sun might be doing a record with Daniel Sun on Street Corner. I got to work out the specifics, mm. but. Yeah. Um, what else? What else? What's the new shit? Estee Knack. I like Knack. Knack's a maniac. He's yeah. fucking wild. I love it. Um, Rome Streets, I was saying I was kind of late to Rome Streets, but he's he's really fucking good. Yeah. I really like Rome Streets. Um, Crime Apple. I love Crime Apple. Vitamin D is a fucking maniac. Mm. Um. Yeah, it's a, you know people can talk their shit, but there's honestly probably more dope shit now than there's ever been. Yeah, you just, you you just gotta, gotta look for it. it. Yeah, at the least back in the day, they would have some type of marketing budget that it would find us. You yeah. know what I mean? Now you just gotta do like three or four more clicks <laughs> yes. to find this shit. <laughs> but it's there. Yeah. Trust me. I mean, yeah. God, trust me, and fuck with Bandcamp. Buy the shit. Yeah, Bandcamp is a is a very cool. Yeah. it's its own like scene of stuff. Yeah, and you'd be yeah, surprised you... how many people like it's free. Like, just pay what yeah. you want, and like pay a dollar for it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, or or yeah. listen to it, and if you like it, go back and spend your money on something. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Because we're getting fucked. <laughs> it's a whole like, yeah. man, we need to figure out how to do this SAG after shit. We need to figure out how to right. do a writer's guild strike. You know what I mean? That's that's been really interesting to see because I mean it's very obvious, like it, and and what is happening is so obviously wrong. So like, and it's Sag so after it, and it's so linear between yes, film and music. Yes, the but I wish, thing. I wish there was more power like that for musicians and artists and uh, producers and everybody to be able to be like, no, we're not, we're not making yeah. stuff unless the deal is right. Yeah. Um. And yeah, unfortunately, like once people get rich, they just want to be rich. Yeah, that's the fucked up thing. At, at Look, all I costs. Said yeah. The other day on Instagram, I was like, if the top twenty streaming artists on Spotify pull their music for a week, everything would change. Yes, everything would change for yeah. one week. It wouldn't be about negotiations. They'd be trying to negotiate. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, it's just uh, it's gross. I know. Literally, the I mean, name me an under another uh, industry that completely, and it's not devalued. It's like they unvalued their product. Yeah. Like there's no value to music if you don't have to pay. If the, if you don't have to pay for something to get it, it has no value. Yeah. It has no monetary value. But yeah. for some fucking reason, the, the music industry is making more money than it's ever made. Right. And the people that make the fucking music are making exponentially less than they've ever made. Come on. Well, man. The, the, the problem is too is you don't have when you don't when you're not paying for the music, you don't have the same connection to it and like the right. same appreciation for Passive. it. It's just like yeah, it's just another yeah. like all right, this is more music. Yeah. Um, I I had heard a podcast uh, where they were trying to figure out it was like a uh tech situation that was like a weird situation that we're trying to figure out and this this girl i think she was like early 20s uh you know the the spotify wrapped like top five artists or whatever it's like her top five artists are like drake rihanna 
and then you know who who you would expect like top spotify streaming artists and then this one random dude that she was like i don't i've never heard of this guy i don't know how this guy got on my my top five like i don't understand what happened so the whole podcast they go through and figure it out and what they eventually figure out is this guy is her top streamed artist because he has a song called alexa play some music so she just says with no preference at all she just says alexa play some music and she's like yeah i would just say that and just listen and to whatever's popular purpose, and then she'd have to play something and it would, oh my yes and it would yeah so genius yes so but genius also like she, so gross yes because she has no musical preference at all she's like just play whatever's popular i just want to hear some music just turn the faucet on and that that like i'm I have so many feelings about that because I'm like, yeah, that's genius and hilarious. And I, I love that that guy did that. But then I'm also like, that's it just crushes me that she just has, that she has no preference at all. She's like, I don't know, play Yo, whatever people are listening though. to. That's everybody. Yeah. Like two years ago, I was outside of a fucking bar and I was like, oh my God. Most people don't give a fuck what's playing. Yeah. The majority of people don't care what music is playing in a club. Their music their 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 nightlife is not governed by yeah. any type of art or creativity. They just want to go get yeah. fucked up and party. Yeah. I'm forty eight years old. I have never gone anywhere <laughs> in my adult life out of my own admonition that was not governed by music or some type of artistic experience. Yeah. I don't right. go to like, no, like, you know, Hey man, let's go. You know, it always used to be like all the homies would be like, we about to go to the club and get on some bitches. <laughs> <laughs> and I might go and like n turn right around. Like I can't No, I'm selfish. I need. I'm no. Get the fuck out of here. Do you hear that shit? Yeah, that shit is yeah, horrible. Right. Yeah, I can't be in a space that I advocate against. I deleted my yes. Facebook yes. like fucking fifteen years ago. You yeah. know what I mean? Regardless, I don't have people. You need a Facebook for your label. Fuck Facebook. I don't need anything <laughs> right. that I don't want for my label. You know what I mean? I don't need a TikTok. Yeah. I don't need threat. I didn't sign up for threads. I don't fucking care, yo. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And I, if I got to be that guy, I'll be the guy. Like, I don't care. Like, someone's got to stand up all the way and ride that shit out. If I were to pivot right now, all of my actions up to this point would be for absolutely nothing. If I would yeah. start worrying about how to get how to get street, how to get stro on playlists and soundtrack on this, it's over with. As soon as my yeah. mind shifts in that direction, all yeah. of this is gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The, and the I, might artistic... a, I might be able to get a few more bedrooms out of it. Right. But I didn't start this shit to get bedrooms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got to be the example. And if I die tomorrow, knock on wood, everyone's <laughs> going to be like, oh, man, shoes kept it real. Yeah, but you were fucking... You weren't saying that when I had breath in my lungs. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I got to find a bouncer for my funeral. Like, man, I seen that shit you said on Twitter. You ain't getting in. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. But, we, you know, just like you do, we just got to keep pushing the shit that we love. It's not going to yeah. change the world, but it can change a few lives, maybe, as long as we turn some ears and educate some people and yeah. stand our fucking ground. That's what that's we're been the, Yeah, that's been the most rewarding thing about the YouTube channel yeah. is people like I get to talk about stuff that I love at length and people watch it and then they'll comment and be like, you've turned me on to like a bunch of new music right. or like, this is the greatest album ever. I love this. Right. Or like, I now I appreciate this like so much on a further level, this yeah. the song that I already knew. So like, 
getting to connect with people and uh, like nerd out a little bit about like, isn't this thing amazing? Like, let's, right. let's just talk about us. this for a little bit. And then finding yeah. out what matters to us matters to others. Yes. And yeah. then we can pull in some strangers here and there. And then now it matters yeah. to them. You know yes. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. One and with, that. yeah. And, and I mean, the same thing as, as a, a DJ would do. Uh, same thing. Like, you know, I'll, I might reel someone in with, like a Kanye video and then they stick around and then they're learning about Edwin Birdsong or now they're on Dela or like now they're, you know, cause I also have a, uh, like a more regular, like structured music background. Like I grew up playing piano and, right. and bass and all that. So sometimes I pivot to like, let's talk about what's going on theory wise here. Um, and so I'm trying to like make, those connections for people either, on, you know, on both sides, like if you, you come from a structured, the educated world, like, well, let's talk about that over here on this D'Angelo song. Like I talked about, um, uh, counterpoint and like Beethoven five on chicken grease. And, and then people were like, Oh yeah, great. That's, I understand what you're saying. So being able to talk about it like that and then have someone understand and, and be like, yeah, I, I love this song too, or I love this music too. Right. And then the same thing, like taking them on a journey with a, a DJ set, like, Hey, let's, let's move here. Let's move here. Let's move here. That's the most rewarding part for sure. You play records too. Uh, I do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, Get you to play a set on the fucking stream, man. Come on. Come do, like, well, I would love to. I love to I like, love tell to. people, like, don't bring anything. Like, just come. That would. Like, an hour before uh, you play, pull records out. And yeah, I'm definitely, play. I'm definitely more Serato right. than records. Uh, I would love to do that. Right. Um, that'd be amazing. I've done two on YouTube. When I hit hundred K I did a live stream DJ set and I played bass on stuff too. Right. Um, and then same thing with 200. So I've been like, you know, every checkpoint or whatever I'm, I'm doing a new set. So, right. um, and figuring stuff out, that would be, that'd be amazing. That'd be super fun. Yeah, and when, that's, that's also like, you know, a, a part of me is like, that's a lot of pressure. No, it's not. It's, dig, listen, dig, it's it's so well, I, 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 I feel you, but, but <laughs> check me out. It's so casual. Like, this is not, like, I, I understand. Of course, it's like, I got to play it. Shut up. But, like, nah. Like, I tell people, like, <laughs> pick records out, but don't play shit that you know. Play shit that looks interesting to you. Like, mm. pull shit out. Like, what's on this? And I'll be like, oh, shit. Like, yo, cue up track two, track two on side mm. two. Oh shit! Word, you know what I mean? Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an educational process. It's not just coming yeah. to fuck around. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All and right. It, and there's whiskey in the coffee. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a, a perfectly great time. That's no, awesome. let me know whenever, bro. I do Mondays and Wednesdays. I, it'd be great to have you. Yeah. It's always uh, better. When, I mean, you know, it's always better when someone's here. Yeah, for that sure. That I can beat up with the records too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, I'll definitely like yeah. Stuff's crazy right now because I'm about to have another kid. But uh, once I'm past maybe, that, maybe maybe before, maybe like <laughs> maybe Wednesday. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> drop the kid off at school. You know, I'll be gone by the time you drop the kid off at school. Pull up for a couple hours. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Open be... invitation. Open doors. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that'll be. That'd be a good time for sure. This has been great. Um, there's there's a ton of stuff in here. I think people are going to love this. I love just, yeah, nerding out, talking about music shit. That's And with someone who appreciates it on another level. Right. Um, so it's great getting to talk to people directly like this. And, yeah, so thank you for your time. Thank you for no, – um, This is great. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, keep doing it. I'm gonna keep doing it. You keep doing it. You come over here and do it, though. <laughs> that, <yeah. laughs> I'll take you up on it for sure. That'd be awesome. Word up. Let me know, bro. Um, 
uh, shoes. Thank you so much uh, for your time, for your stories, for your wisdom. Um, yeah, appreciate you coming on uh, on the podcast to share share your story, share all your stuff, especially that Secret Service story. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. You know, I wouldn't have uh, stories to tell if well, people wouldn't know the stories if there were not spaces for me to tell them in. So. Once again, yeah. thank you and much respect for what you're doing, bro. You know what I mean? Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.